Hello, everyone. Let me introduce Brittany Bean. She's the CEO and co-founder of Sundrop. Hi, all. My name is Brittany, and I'm the co-founder of Songdrop, and a clicker that doesn't work. <laughs> oh, wait, there we go. So today, I'm going to talk about, talk about all the things that I have fucked up. There are many of them. This is only a, a short and brief list of the many, many things I have destroyed since I started working in startups in 2006. They were both my own startups, other people's startups, just other people anywhere near me that I have done something that's been negative to. Uh, never intentionally, but things just don't always go according to plan. Um, I am also not completely full of shit. Um, I have started a few businesses. You can see them here, they're all crossed out. Uh, they're crossed out because they don't really work anymore, um, either because I did something wrong, someone else did something wrong, it just wasn't the right time. Um, that, according to a lot of people, makes me a serial entrepreneur, um, which is a phrase I actually am not a very big fan of, because I think I'm actually more of a serial fuck-up. Um, it's just like, keep breaking stuff everywhere I go, and, you know, thinking that eventually one of those things will work, and I'll kind of make it happen eventually, and, you know, every time you start a business, it's very rosy and wonderful, and you think to yourself, like, it's totally fine. This time we'll actually get an accountant to do the stuff at company's house, and I won't just do it myself, so that won't be the thing that breaks. And then you do get an accountant, and it's not a very good accountant, and then they break something else, and you still have a business running four and a half years later that's never even traded and doesn't have a bank account that you still can't close because there was a VAT invoice somewhere. That is true, and it's happening to me right now, and I really hope it won't be tomorrow. So the list of companies you saw there range from tech startups to music companies to a record label to a design and development agency. Uh, I was an artist manager for a bit for bands. Um, so I don't like to limit myself in my failures. I like to spread them out across a multitude of industries and give everyone a fair shot at having me, you know, mess it up. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the biggest things that I've screwed up um, and then go through some of the things I've learned because of that. Uh, as a kind of preemptive warning, just because I tell you about what I mess up doesn't mean you won't mess it up too because someone told me every single thing that I did wrong. Every single thing I'm going to go through, someone warned me about and I did it anyway because I'm very bad at listening. So, I have no idea what I'm doing. Still don't, don't have any idea what I'm doing right now. And the first time I started a business was right after I came out of working for two other startups. Um, one of them was seed funded and the other one was venture funded by one of the biggest venture capital firms in the world. Um, and like the dog in this car, I thought, it's totally fine. Like, I've been on this ride before, just because I wasn't the driver. Like, I've learned everything you could possibly need to know not to screw it up. Total and complete bullshit. Um, when we first started working on Songdrop, and we had a working prototype, I pitched it at an event called Tech Pitch 4.5, um, which is something I highly recommend anyone who's thinking of doing a startup applies to do. It's very useful, it's very low key, and there are a lot of good people in the audience who you can chat to. Um, we were runners up, and I was like, dude, it's totally fine, we've got this product. I'll go chat to all these kind of angel investors and seed investors that came in afterwards. So I went and had meetings with these people, um, and turned up to a meeting with nothing. Like, literally all I had was this website that we'd made that was a prototype. We had, I think at the time, 35 registered users, of which 34 were my friends, and one person was someone else's friend who was a friend of mine. Um, I was like, whatever, like, it looks cool. It's fine, like, they're gonna see it and be like, this is amazing. And I sat down in one meeting with one investor, and he was like, so how do you plan on making money? And I was like, money? It's a startup, I don't need any money. I just, you give me the money and then I make some stuff and then we're done, right? Like, then like, we just sell it to Google and it's over. This is after I'd worked in two failed startups. Like, this is something I should have known better, 100%. Like, you can't just walk into a meeting and assume that just because you have something, you deserve something else or because some people are using your product, 
it's viable. Like, there's no definitive number, of course, for like what you need in order to get people to give you capital. So it's not as though, I mean, people like to throw numbers around. They're like, oh, you know, if you've got 100,000 downloads on the App Store, you should, you'll be ready to raise a million dollars. Like, that is all BS as well. Um, there's no tried and fast method. Um, there are plenty of businesses that have raised on absolutely nothing and plenty of businesses with hundreds of thousands of users that haven't been able to raise a single thing. Um, I still go into meetings to raise capital and I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, because every single step of the way I'm doing something I haven't done before. It doesn't mean you can't learn it, but you're probably gonna screw up in at least three, four, five, six to 10 or 12 of these meetings, but you'll probably be able to meet with them again. Um, actually that first guy that I met with, who I turned up to the meeting and was like, I don't know, let's look at my website. Um, I've had like eight meetings with him since then. So it's still possible, even though if you turn up and you are a dog driving a car, you know, you never know. You might end up as a race car driver with a dog. Um, I also was really bad at knowing how much money to raise. So I worked on a ticketing company called Ticket Drop. And we were like, we're going to bootstrap it. So because it's a ticketing business, we figured we're not going to need any capital because we'll take money from every ticket that's sold. And I was like, oh, income, what an interesting prospect. We can use this to pay all of our bills while we contract on the side. Um, that's great, except that was like it really didn't work. And I'll go into more detail about why in a bit. But we needed to raise money for that to get it off the ground. Um, when we raised capital for Song Drop in January of this year, we raised 100,000 uh, pounds, which was not really enough money. I probably should have raised about five times that, and I probably could have if I'd known better. But I genuinely thought if I spoke to investors and I was like, oh yeah, you know, we only need this much cash to make this work, and it's under SEIS. Um, does anyone know what SEIS is in the audience? Um, so this is just a brief interlude. Um, SEIS is an investment scheme that the government has right now where any investor, private investor, can put up to 150,000 pounds into a business and claim around 79% back on taxes. Um, that means that you can make a very, very attractive investment to someone because they can get loads of money back. So I was like, well, we should definitely run this business under SEIS and it'll be fine. So I just pulled a number out of thin air. <laughs> I was like, well, that's fine. A hundred grand is definitely all we need. Um, that was not right. Like, that is the money we took and we've managed to make that work for us. But in reality, I should have raised a whole lot more money than that. There's also the mistake of trying to raise too much money, which is not always the best thing to do either. Um, it will get you attention and it will get you into meetings, but it does mean that when you can't raise that, you're kind of stuck somewhere in the middle trying to figure out who do I go to if I couldn't raise the two million I said I needed. Like, will this investor who I went to for their normal institutional fund want to raise or give me the capital from their seed fund? It's not always going to work that way and you won't always be able to negotiate that. And the best way to really think about how much money do I need to raise is like, how much money do I need to reach a milestone that makes my business worth more money? So we raised 100,000 pounds to release an iOS app. This was in January. It's now September, I think. And we released like one version of our app that's kind of shit, so don't download it yet, um, a couple of weeks ago. And we've got an update coming out now. That's like nine months after we raised the cash. And we did a lot of stuff in the interim of that. But the reason we raised that money was really to move us into mobile. So when you're thinking about how much money you want to raise, think about what it is you want that money to achieve. So it's not necessarily about burn rate or this buys me six months or eight months or 12 months. But does this buy me a thing that makes my business better? or either makes it revenue generating, makes it acquirable, or will make you approachable to bigger investment rounds later on. That's a really important thing to think about if you're considering raising capital, be it angel, seed, or VC money. Um, and thinking about those three is a whole separate conversation in and of itself. Um, feature creep, for anyone, any developers out there, um, is probably one of the things I've broken in every single business I've worked in. 
Um, every time I don't want to address the real problem of the business, I choose to fix, take the one that is the easiest for me. Um, I come from a product background. I like to make stuff. I like to play with things that look cool and sh that are shiny. I like to hang around with developers and designers and stand around telling them what to do while they curse me. And the easiest thing that you can lose kind of time on and lose focus with is thinking, if we just get this feature in, all of our problems will be solved. Uh, no, they're not going to be solved, chances are. Um, so with Songdrop, while we were kind of like arguing about whether or not we should get external developers to work on our app or whether or not our technical co-founder was going to do it in Ruby Motion, I was like, don't worry, guys. We'll just add private playlists, collaborative playlists, like tagging someone in a song. What does that even mean? I don't know. And I designed the feature. Um, all of these things, none of which had to do with sorting out who was going to deal with the iOS app and acquiring users, which were really the only two things that mattered at the time. Um, and still, to be honest, matter for us as a business. Um, in the end, we did both. We got someone kind of outsourced to work on it and did our app in Ruby Motion. And uh, Richard, our technical co-founder, has kind of like taken it on, on himself now. All of these things I could have done in May. But I waited until August because I didn't want to make those decisions. Because making decisions is harder than building stuff. When you can just go, I'm going to make this cool thing. It's going to be really fun. That's way better than being like, I really hope that I don't fuck this up. It's better to fuck something up than to build something no one wants. So definitely avoid, whenever possible, anything to do with feature creep. And it also really adds to your like software management time. So every time you want to do a new release or you want to add something else, you've got to take into account these like other 50 things you put in the app while your CEO was dicking around trying to figure out what to do. And it's much more sensible to keep things as clean as possible. Um, obviously, it's a big sort of like startup adage about doing one thing well and lean startups and all this stuff. And it's fine to take the jargon on. But what's much better is actually to think about what the point of that is. And it's to make sure you're building something that solves a problem and is for an audience. And don't get distracted with all the little things you can add. Or you know, the one person who sends you an email and says, oh, it'd be, it'd be really great if I could upload my own photos onto your music website. Like, no. You don't, one person might want it. And it's great to make one person happy. But how much time is that going to take? And how much time is it going to add on every time you want to do something new? So that is definitely something to avoid. And I've done it in literally everything. I have also made the terrible mistake of thinking I didn't have to market anything because everything I make is so cool. It is not. Like, yeah, it looks nice, and everything we build is very pretty, which is because I have an excellent, excellent design co-founder. But the fact is, it's not product market fit. Cool is not a market. Like, not even us saying that for Songdrop, our market is like music bloggers, who definitely think they're the coolest people in the world. But the fact is, that's not a way to get something to people who are going to use your thing. And you see it all the time. Like, you see people build these kind of like little tools or these little toys, and they're like, well, it's so great. Like, if I build it, everyone's going to come use it. And it doesn't work that way. You have to think about who the product is for, who your customer is, and who your audience is. And it will help avoiding um, this problem as well if you're always thinking about who that customer might be and how to build something that's actually going to get them to use it rather than just build what you think they might want. Um, I mean, a good thing with this as well is actually going and speaking to people. Um, that's something that I didn't do for really anything until about four months ago. Um, and Songdrop had already been built, and we already had a, a web product. And I was like, oh, it's fine. Like, you know, we've got like 10,000 users, and we haven't done any marketing. It's not a problem. The minute I went out to actually ask people what they needed, I was like, I am such a moron. You sort of sit there and you build this stuff because you're like, well, I read this thing on Pitchfork and it was about like how the music industry is changing, so I'll just build a thing to fix that. You need to go and talk to people you think will use your application because they might not be the right people at all. And you may find a whole new problem for them that you didn't know existed. 
Um, we're actually building something into our iOS app, uh, which is going to be like a way to kind of make your phone into a jukebox. And we came up with that by actually asking people what their problems listening to music were. And it wasn't by saying, like, my problem is, like, I don't want to pay for Spotify Premium. Like, that's not a problem. That's just being cheap. And the issue really is more like, we needed to find things that were difficult for listening. And a guy said to me at a house party, and he was like, I've had an argument with some douchebag over at the stereo for the last hour who keeps plugging his phone in, and he's been playing the worst music all night. And I was like, oh, an actual problem to solve. And from there, we were like, well, wouldn't it be great if every time you were at a house party, you just plugged your phone in, and everyone else there could just choose the music that was playing, and you could delete some idiot's music if they have horrible choices, unless it's mine, and then I'll play all the Beyonce I want. Um, related to that is about market size and how you're actually going to get to that market. Um, when we worked on Ticket Drop, we were like, the market for ticketing is massive. I knew that live was going big. I had been um, a tour manager as well. And I was like, everyone is moving to live. That's where the cash in music is now. And we need to get on that. I mean, ticketing is broken. Like, there, I don't know anyone who uses a ticketing service that is like, oh, yes, I'm paying a booking fee. Like, it's not what people want to do. And it's a terrible, terrible way to kind of buy something that should be really fun. So we were like, that's totally fine. The market's massive. We've got that solved. We'll build a really good version of this that will be better. I know loads of people in live, so I can definitely get them all to use it. What we didn't realize was that the market is not open. So uh, we're London-based. And in a venue in London, anything, any venue that's kind of over 600 capacity is going to be controlled by either a promoter or a ticketing company. And what happens there means you can't actually sell tickets for those venues. So if you kind of look at the maths behind that, it's like any 600 person venues probably selling tickets that are like 10 quid. We were charging a 10% booking fee flat, which was covering our card processing fees, which in 2009 was like something like 35 pence per transaction. So the margins, not so great. And you need to sell so many tickets. There are in London, I think there were like 150, 600 person and under venues that sold ticketed events. So even if we had complete and utter control of the market, we wouldn't even be enough making enough money to really run the business. Added to that was completely not understanding that in order to open a bank account that would allow us to sell tickets, this is in like 2008, guys, so like things have changed. People have Stripe now, all these magical ways to take payments. And we had to open a merchant bank account, which cost 250,000 pounds just to open the account. And we had to leave that 250,000 pounds in the bank account in order to do events because it's such a highly fraudulent business. And at the time, I was just like, ah, fuck all that. We're just going to sell some tickets. I'll get my friends to do it. It's fine. We'll use PayPal. No, PayPal closed our account, shut the whole thing down. I'm not the only PayPal disaster story. Like the, um, there was a Ruby conference, I think in Scotland that had all their stuff shut down as well. Um, and that was all based on me not doing the research. I was like, I know the market's big. I know this is happening. I have like insider knowledge about where 360 deals in the industry are going without even thinking about all the stuff that actually goes into that as a business. Um, I would love to do ticketing again, but I don't necessarily recommend it due to the problems I just mentioned. Um, a lot of things have become easier for that, but do your research. Think about the market and think about what possible barriers there are and why someone hasn't done what you want to do now. Because there's going to be probably a pretty good reason for that to happen. Um, I wish that I had done. We failed fast on that one, to be fair. I think we shut that down about six months after we got started. Um, but that was definitely like a mega fail. Um, and it's, it's a real shame it didn't work out. Um, the other big problem that I had, um, and I actually did this about three months ago. So this is a recent fail, um, was not really knowing where we were going with the business. Um, and that's part of that is based on not necessarily understanding what our product was when we made it and not understanding kind of 
where we were actually planning to take the business. Um, one of our advisors said to me, well, if I gave you money right now, um, where, how much share capital am I going to have in five years' time? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Excellent question, Philip. Um, and at that moment, I was like, I have no clue what, uh, what I'm doing. I've taken people's money. I've joined an accelerator. We're a part of Wyro, by the way, which is probably why I'm standing here. Um, and we didn't actually understand like where in five years' time we would stand, dilution-wise, with our shares, where our investors would stand, uh, where anyone else who we were going to give capital to was going to be, and what our plan was for raising financing. Um, we had a really nice roadmap for the product, but we didn't have a very good roadmap for the business. Um, and I immediately walked out of that meeting, and we also have a part-time financial director, and was like, uh, Chris, how do, can we let, fix this? And he was like, yeah, sure. Sat down, worked out a cap table that made sense, and a lot of kind of where we wanted the business to go fell out of figuring that out. Um, we had an understanding of how many times we could actually raise money before the founders would end up with less than 50%. Um, and you need to know when you're going to lose control of your business, and you need to be making enough money at that point to not care. Um, or maybe not. You know, some people never want to lose or be under 50% um, or 51%. So you know, some people, it's fine as long as they have an angel investor or two or seed investors who they believe will always be on their side and vote with them. Um, it's important to understand not only where the product is going, so not only where you know, your business as a roadmap is headed, but actually where kind of the financing for that is going to come from, how many rounds you plan to raise. Um, and you know, I think depending on if you're a big sort of B2B company and you're going to be trying to make revenue straight away, or if you're someone like us and you're like consumer all the way, maybe you'll have revenue at this point or this point, and kind of mapping out where that sits with where you would need to start raising money. And you'll have like a billion different scenarios. We have these really terrifying spreadsheets um, of kind of all the different revenue models and all the investment and when it would come in. And using that really helps us to understand how we can hire and how we can grow the business and what we need to do that. Um, I'm not allowed to touch it because I create these like circular loops in Excel. So I'm not allowed to use it. I also recommend if you're like, not good at business, find someone who is. Um, I can talk a lot, but I'm really bad at spreadsheets. So I found someone who was very good at that, who would help me do it and find revenue streams and stuff. Um, but kind of bake that into your where you're going and think about all the stuff and all the places you can't navigate and find the people who can get you to where you want your end goal to be, whatever that end goal may be. And it will change, by the way. Um, I mean, our current end kind of scenario for what we're doing has changed about 80 times. Um, and kind of keep that stuff in mind. Uh, so to sum up the things I've screwed up, I didn't have a plan at all when I got started uh, working on pretty much any project I've worked on. Um, anything else I do from now on, having some vague plan about what I'm doing rather than just a product. Um, I raised too little money and I probably could have raised more. Um, and you need to think about the amount of money you want to raise if you want to raise it. Uh, feature creep is probably my biggest weakness. Uh, product market fit is very important. Don't ignore it. Um, didn't do enough market research, which led to us having to kill a business after about six months. And I didn't think about the future at the start, um, which is very important to do. That is all the things I've fucked up, but I have learned some things along the way. Um, that don't fit into any of that. I'm calling them bonus extras. One is there are a lot of idiots in startups. They mean well and they want to help you. They call themselves advisors. And they turn up and they introduce themselves to you and they're like, I think what you're doing is really great. It looks really cool. You seem really good. I'd love to help you out. Can I be an advisor? Sure. Don't listen to everyone who comes up to talk to you. Um, uh, some of the best advice I've ever received, uh, ironically, is uh, from the guy who runs Techstars. And he said, don't take anyone's advice unless you can action it the minute you walk away from them. 
um, which for someone who's been giving advice for the last 30 minutes is an amusing thing to say. Um, but that is the best advice I've ever received. Um, people come up and tell me ridiculous things. Um, someone came up to me and said, we should change our business into a B2B play and allow uh, producers to save the music they were interested in. So to market our product only to record producers. And I looked at this woman and I was like, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to come over here and speak to me without introducing yourself and telling me what you think I should do with my business. Um, but do you know anything about the music industry? She was like, no. I was like, do you know any record producers? No. Do you know how big the market is? No. Do you know what my burn rate is? No. Thank you very much. It's lovely to meet you. Um, these people will come and they will tell you this stuff and they do mean well. Um, they want to help. There are a lot of people that do want to help, but it is best to try and remember that you know better than they do. Um, not about everything, but about what it is you want the business to be and what you're building, you're going to know better than some random person who's just turned up to chat to you. Um, be careful about them, especially people who ask you for equity. Don't just start handing out equity because someone who's like the former CEO of something with capital at the end of it and an LLP has offered to advise you. Tell them you want a six month trial and if you think they've added enough value then you're consider giving them 0.25%. Um, beware anyone who wants equity and definitely, definitely beware anyone who wants cash up front to advise your startup. There are plenty of actual good advisors out there who will do this for free. Um, they will want to talk to you and they'll want to help you out because they care about the ecosystem. Um, you can find them at pretty much any event and you'll have heard most of their names bounded about before. It's an important thing to remember, like don't start paying people for advising and, and don't give away equity until you have a relationship with someone and you know they can add value to what, everything you're doing. Because um, that value they add for one month when you're starting out may be completely useless 12 months down the line and you may have given them a pretty large chunk of equity, um, which then comes down to all that dilution stuff from earlier. Uh, ignore the press. And if there's any of you here, sorry, but there is so much bullshit that is written about in tech blogs. The stories you read on TechCrunch and in the next web and on Mashable have been spun like eight different ways through 80 different people. Um, it's what, you know, it's what a PR wants everyone to hear. It's what a CEO wants everyone to hear. It's what um, the journalist thinks is the best possible story. What it isn't is probably the truth. Um, you know, this company raised what I think I read the other day. It was like, see the deck that raised Dewal that raised Dewala $16.8 million. And you're like, the deck didn't raise them that. The fact that those dudes were like next level competent, had like run and exited like four businesses apiece is what raised them the money. Beware anything you read and beware these kind of stories that sound like it's, you know, this guy comes out of nowhere and then suddenly he's just raised five million and starting this massive company. Bullshit. I can guarantee, guarantee that he's either run a tiny business that was aqua hired before and then he spent four years as a product manager at Google or some other way it's happening. It's, it's never this kind of rags to riches tale that they make out. Uh, that being said, make friends with the press. Um, they're not hard to befriend. They are very busy though, so uh, my best recommendation for that, find them when they're somewhere, buy them a drink, journalists love drinks, and be nice. Tell them what you're doing, but don't necessarily ask them for a story until you're comfortable pitching for that. So remember, don't be, believe what you read, but make sure you tell them what to write about you. Because um, you want everyone else to be reading about what you do and think that you came out of nowhere and raised a bunch of money and did something super, super cool. Focus on the funnel. I'm really bad at this. I'm trying to get better. <laughs> um, what's most important is what happens when someone gets to your product and then you take them to where it is you want them to go. You're deciding what their journey in your product is. Are you trying to get a shit ton of signups for your website? Are you trying to get a load of downloads? Are you trying to sell in-app purchases? Are you trying to do SaaS revenue? Be concerned every step of the way about what's happening to every single user. Look at where they're falling out. Like, why are people coming to my website and not signing up? 
A-B tests the shit out of everything. It's so easy to do now. There's like loads of ways to do it. I'm pretty sure there's like a gem in Ruby for this. I don't even know what a gem in Ruby is, but someone told me that. Um, there's loads of ways that you can test the funnel now. Um, there's plenty of really good metrics programs out there like Mixpanel, Kiss Metrics. All this stuff will help you understand your funnel and understand retention and where the users come from. The most important thing for you, if you're a consumer startup, is what's happening to these people that turn up. Um, you don't want a high bounce rate, you don't want people running away, and you want to understand where they're going. Um, part of that is also about feeding that funnel once you get it straight. Um, we still have loads of holes in our funnel. We actually did an A-B test on our homepage and um, on our like first step after sign up. Uh, we've been running it for about three weeks now. It's amazing because it's completely even. I was like, great, so that was the most useless A-B test of all time, and now we have to A-B test the A's and the B's. Um, and it's something that's gonna take time and you think it's really annoying and tedious, but it will really, really, really help. And it will help you in the long run understand who your users are. Be nice. Be nice because it is the right thing to do. And be nice because you never know who that person stood next to you at the bar is. You have no idea who that random human who sent you an email, who was asking if you knew this person or knew about this, who they are. Um, at every step of the way, someone's helped me. Loads of people have been unbelievably kind to me. They've introduced me to people without me having to ask. They've gone out of their way to make sure that I've been able to get something done. And I am terribly grateful for all of that. Um, and it's really important that you kind of like give back. Um, don't ignore people if you can. And if you do, send them an email two months later and apologize. I've done that. Like, there's nothing worse than having to send someone an email and be like, really sorry, I didn't listen to you two months ago. Still need help with that introduction? Um, do it anyway. You still look like a better person than some asshole who just ignored them because you think you're too important and you're too busy. You're not. Um, it will come back all the time and help you. And it will constantly like, make you better at your job and make you better at being able to understand what's happening around you as well. You want to know gossip? Be nice to people. They'll tell you stuff. It's amazing. Um, it's a much easier way to understand what's happening in the startup community than reading fucking like the kernel. Um, I highly recommend just being nice to people. Plus, making friends is more fun than not making friends. And then they buy you drinks, and then I like them more. Uh, and remember, even if you fuck up, you can always start again. Britney Spears made it through 2007. If she did that and came back in her career, I promise you that anything you break will not completely destroy your life. It's much better to do something and screw it up than to do nothing. Um, don't get like release-itis. Don't get scared about not putting something out because you're worried it's not perfect. Don't be scared to start something because you don't know if the idea has been tested enough. Just do stuff because you can always start again. And doing this makes it a hell of a lot easier when you act like this eventually. Because um, you will screw things up and you will probably upset people and you know you might say fuck too many times in a talk But I highly recommend that you just do stuff and then remember that even if it breaks you can do it again So does anyone have any questions? Feel free ask away um, Or you can email me if you don't want to ask in front of everyone um, or feel free as well to harangue me on Twitter or talk about me being bad at this. That's also fine. Take criticism well. Um, I'm not sure quite how relevant this is. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> But do you know where would be a good place to turn to if you wanted to raise, hypothetically, 500 million pounds? Um, 500 million? Yeah. Um, the US government, the <laughs> defense contract? Oh, really? I mean, I don't know much about raising anything over about like two. 
Okay. <laughs> um, I think if you're looking for really big money, um, you need to go kind of to the bigger, like if you think about the amount of people who have that kind of capital, it's going to be a bit, a bit different than um, the kind of smaller standard VCs. Um, I don't actually know anyone who's raised anything over about 50. Um, and that's usually going to be a syndicate. Um, so you usually get a multitude of venture capitalists putting cash in. Um, I, to be honest, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay. Um, sorry. Thanks, Vinny. Nope. Cool. Thanks, y'all. Once again, feel free to email me. I will help you, by the way. Thank you.